There's a guy by the name of Nelson Gluick. He's a renowned Jewish archaeologist. This is what he says verbatim. This is quote. It, and he's a Jew. He's not a Christian. It may be stated that no archaeological discovery has ever controverted a biblical reference. I want to answer the question, why? Why would God write a book? I kind of hinted and alluded to this a little bit earlier, but really God wants a relationship with you. He wants a relationship with me. He wants a relationship with all of us runaway renegades, let's, let's call it. Um, and in relationships, people self-define. You have the opportunity to tell the other person who you are, what you like. And if I were to get to know you, you would have to self-define. You would have to tell me who you are. I would be, it'd be quite rude of me to go ahead and to project and to hijack your personality and project upon you what I want you to be. Just like that would be if we didn't have the scripture, we'd be doing that to God. In a relationship, people must self-define. See, God is not an impersonal cosmic force. He is a person. He wants to be known and he will and he has self-defined who he is, his standards, his morals, what he thinks on things. The Bible is God's inside scoop. It's his revelation. I'm going to say this is that the Bible, the New Testament specifically, and the whole Bible is humanity's most reliable document. That's a big claim. It's humanity's most reliable document. There are many stories in the Bible that have been confirmed by archaeology. Um, there are still some things in the Bible which have not been confirmed by, archae by archaeology. But the important thing is to know that there has never been an archae archaeological claim that has ever... Um, that has never contradicted the Bible and what the Bible says. Never. There's never been an archaeological claim that's, that said it's not true. I'll, I'll put it in these words. There's a guy by the name of Nelson Gluick. He's a renowned Jewish archaeologist. This is what he says verbatim. This is quote. It, and he's a Jew. He's not a Christian. It may be stated that no archaeological discovery has ever controverted a biblical reference. That's amazing. Sometimes there's Bible names that haven't been discovered yet, I will add, um, but they haven't been discovered, but doesn't mean that's contradictory. Um, because, and as I mentioned, a discovery has never contradicted the Bible. I'll give you a really cool example because this shows how the New Testament is insanely accurate, which is very cool. Is that in, in John, when John describes, and you probably a bunch have heard this if you haven't looked it up, the pool of Bethesda. This is an actual place that he describes and he talks about. And he's very specific, saying there are five porticos, five walkways that lead up to this. And for the longest time, scholars did not think that this existed because they'd never found it. They thought it was a made up thing. Some even thought it was, it was a poem or as an anecdotal type of, of thing that he was talking about but really what ended up happening is archaeologists discovered this in the recent history they discovered this place called the pool of bethesda and they just found it and it took them so long to find it because it was actually buried 40 feet underground it was buried 40 feet under and get this it was complete with the five porticos into the detail that john described it Another confirmation. Boom. Thank you. There you go. That's another confirmation of the Bible. It's an interesting, if you look at in Acts, Luke, who's the author, he names 32 countries, 54 cities, nine islands without a single error. Archaeology confirms of their locations and the names of what they were by other documents and they can prove that that was accurate. Like I mentioned, you have to ask this question compared to what? And we're going to get to that in a second. See, the Bible today is the same as the original manuscripts from thousands of years ago. This is really interesting. To uh, You guys have all heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, they were discovered in 1947. It contained Old Testament manuscripts that had dated 1,000 years before the manuscripts that we had. So this, this is why this is important, is... The, new, the, the Old Testament was, we have 
over 5,000 manuscripts of the Old Testament, like 5,000 of them, and they all are put together, compared, checked off of one another, and written. And, and that's how the Old Testament was formed because we're able to check the accuracy and, and the lack of inerrancy through all of them because you can compare one page to page 80 to page 4,000, blah, 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 blah. You can compare all of those things and you can find the accuracy. So that's how the Old Testament was formed. And then, in 1947, they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, which were a thousand years older than the manuscripts that we had, and that they were completely accurate compared to what we had. Um, the really inter- like the, w- the way I would I would describe it to you. Let's say it's my birthday, and you write me a message in a card, a happy birthday card, and you go ahead and write that message five thousand more times, and you give me five thousand birthday cards right? You give me all the, now I'm able to go through every single one where you wrote the same message and I'm able to see, okay, the message is consistent. There might be the odd slight difference, like a, a different way to spell a word, maybe a slight spelling error. Maybe there's a little bit of a, a, a sentence structure that's different, but, but with those 5,000, we are able to get the meaning to immense accuracy of what was trying to get across. That is how many manuscripts we had before the Dead Sea, the Dead sea Scrolls came in to actually um, confirm what we had, which is amazing. But the Dead Sea Scrolls, when they were compared to what we have already done, it found that it was 99.5% in agreement. That's unbelievable. And now the 0.5% disagreement was due to minor spelling errors or sentence structures that didn't change the meaning of what was trying to be portrayed. What that would be like is me looking at you and saying, you're awesome, bro. Or me saying, bro, you're awesome, right? Minor sentence change, but the same meaning is still conveyed that you're awesome. I think that is so crazy cool. I hope I've laid out my case for you as to why you can trust the Bible. Now the question is, what are we gonna do with that? Why is that important? What does that have anything to do with me? You see, when we break it down, all of those things are cool reasons, and I want them, I want it to help you that this book that we love, this book that we cherish, is not just some superstitious book. It's not just some made up fairy tale. It's not just some type of thing that someone wrote that we can interpret and use as analogies to our life. No, this is historically accurate. These are things that have happened. People can agree from so many other documents outside of the Bible, from different countries that have written and recorded history, that Jesus was a man, he was born, he lived in a certain area, he lived for 33 years, he had encounters with, with Pontius Pilate, um, he, he, miracles happened, he fed people. There's all these different things that people can agree upon. And that's awesome that we can look back at that. But what I wanna say is all of that and what I laid a foundation for is simply to help you take a step towards trusting who God is what he says he is, what he says he's going to do, and what his son did for us. See, knowing that we can trust the word, that the word is inerrant, that the word stands up, that it's God-inspired, we need to know that so that when we build a relationship with Jesus, when we build a relationship with God, when we go ahead and we go that direction, is that we are going to use the word of God to get to know him. See, God is his word. That is God's self-definition to us. And us as Christians, and if you don't have a relationship with God, if you don't consider yourself a Christian, it's not this religious, strange thing. All it is, at broken down, is just a relationship with God. So I want to ask and pose a question to you is, do you trust, do you truly trust, and be honest with yourself, do you truly trust what God's word says? Because God is true to his word. And in order for us to be able to dive in and build that relationship and not just know, but experience what God has for us, we have to be able to trust that. But it doesn't just come from reading the word. It doesn't just come from understanding it like a textbook and getting an A plus and knowing our scriptures and historical context and knowing who was what and where and why. That's awesome to know and good to know. 
But the real thing, and this is where you look at the religious people in the New Testament that Jesus kept going after, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they knew, man, they knew the word, but they missed it on the relationship with Jesus. They missed it into building. Jesus, the Savior, was right there. And they didn't even have a, build a relationship with him. But us, we can build a relationship with him. When you build a relationship with him by getting to know his word, by talking, convening with him on a daily basis, your trust in what he says and what he has for you and his salvation will start to grow daily, just like it would with one of those new kids that you met on the block and you guys are getting to know each other and your relationship builds, the daily interaction. Get to know God's word, get to know who he is, Ask him questions. Talk to him. Tell him your frustrations. Jesus is so personal. He wants to know you. He wants you to know him and what he has. And when you start doing this, you will be able to trust the name of Jesus and what it stands for. Not because I told you to, but because you know him. Because you've put in the work. Because you trust what he says. And you experience what he says. See, that is so vital. And I don't know where you're at. I don't know what you've been up to. I don't know how your life has been for the last six months, but God knows. See, God cares about you. He loves you. He sees you. You might think you're all alone in a room and no one cares about you. Everyone's forgotten about you. God cares about you more than you could ever imagine. His love is so immense for you. And he wants you to get to know. And if there are things that you've been going through, like this past Sunday, I was thinking on and talking with a friend about the power of a name. And names carry weight. When we say certain names, see, when I say the name of Jesus, there's a lot of things that come with it. But some of the things that come with it, when I say Jesus, I think of life. I think of power. I think of authority. I think of love. When I say the name Jesus, I think of provision. I think of breakthrough. I think of, he's got my back. I think of love, that he loves me so much, that he came just for me, just for you. When I think of Jesus, I think of forgiveness. I think of salvation. I think of, 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 of taking every single guilt and shame that I might have gone. See, that's what happens when you think and you trust and you know the name of Jesus and what it means. So wherever you are at, I want you to get to a place where you know and trust the name of Jesus. Don't take my word for it. Check what I'm saying. Build that relationship with God. Dive into his word. Because when you choose to focus on the name of Jesus, that is when breakthrough begins. When you choose to trust and focus on what Jesus did and all the promises and the kingdom of God that we can experience, that is where life starts. Freedom starts. Freedom from fear, freedom from anxiety, God's health and healing is yours, his provision, his breakthrough, his life, the Zoe life and everything that encompasses God is involved with that, but it comes out of this trust.